Hello everyone, I'm Secretary of Agriculture Sonny Perdue and I'd like to welcome you to the sunny side of the farm. Welcome everyone, this is Sonny Perdue and I want to welcome you all back to the sunny side of the farm. This is a podcast that tells you what we're doing here at the Department of Agriculture and where we hope to go. Today I am fascinated to be joined by Guy, Guy Sermon a City Journal contributing editor and a former economics professor at the Paris Institute of Political Sciences. Uh, I didn't really know much. I must confess, I didn't know much about you, Guy, until I read your work in the Wall Street Journal, and then I pursued with further essays and see that you've been writing about these issues for many, many years. So it's great to have you with us here. And uh, maybe I have some listeners that may not be familiar with your work as well, Guy. So tell us a little bit about what you do and what you've done. Well, first of all, Mr. Secretary, I mean, they thank you to have me in the, uh, I, I guess you will accept my French accent. <laughs> I can't hide it, yeah. but I guess you have some kind of a southern accent. <laughs> yes, that's right. And uh, yeah. so I'm a, I'm a French economist and the, uh, I'm working on development issues uh, since more than 40 years. Um, I'm mostly interested in development strategies. I mean, how do you bring people from poverty to a decent life. And this is one of the reasons why I focused on the so-called green revolution, innovation in agriculture, because if you look at the world since 40, 50 years, this has been the only positive revolution. A revolution is always a bit ambiguous, but the so-called green revolution, which really brought millions of people out of poverty, and the, uh, out of famine, out of hunger. This has been the most positive revolution during my life and during our life. And this is the focus of my work. Well, congratulations to what you've written about and what you've uh, identified, even going back to the, the Green Revolution by Norman Borlaug, who we revere here. Uh, but as you indicated, uh, his work is somewhat forgotten. I guess my question is from a layman's perspective, are we victims of that success? It seems like we've forgotten some of the lessons that have gotten us here based on the anti-cultural of modern technology of agriculture. Yeah, I mean, they, you're right. We are victims of our success because for example, uh, we, nearly everybody on earth, I mean, 95 people of the body of the people on earth, I mean, they can eat decently on a daily basis. This is totally new. I mean, if you go back, you know, 40 years behind us, I mean, the uh, millions of people in India, in China, in Africa were starving. They are not starving anymore. And for us, I mean, this miracle is uh, like an evidence. We totally forgot how we uh, succeeded in the transition from starvation to relative satisfaction. Uh, we have some uh, nutrition, of course, but the situation is a, it is a, a revolution. So um, we have got accustomed to it. it. It's a new normal. And we have totally forgotten how we got there. Well, you know, I know that you have the facts on your side, but if you hear some people talk about today, I call them glass half full people. We talk about all the starving people in the world and the food insecure people, but the facts are exactly as you said. It's miraculous of where we've come from with the, uh, the food security that has been attained. And I think you mentioned the fact that uh, there are two primary things that have happened to that, science, technology, and uh, modern commerce and logistics. And uh, speak to us about that. Yeah, that's very important because innovation as such is good, but has no consequences. Innovation must be combined with trade, with commerce, with entrepreneurship. So the, the real change and the real revolution and the success story has been the combination of scientific innovation and commerce and, and trade. You, you, you cannot separate both, you know? And the, yeah, it's very important today when you have so many ideological movements saying, let's go back to organic food or this kind of thing. They, they totally ignore uh, the fundamentals and the two, and, and once again, you cannot separate both. Trade and innovation goes hand in hand. And this goes beyond agriculture. 
Well, it does go beyond agriculture, and I th think we're seeing it played out on the global stage today. But yeah. as I read, even normal Borlaug, with his miracle of the Green Revolution and the genetics in rice, faced this same sort of thing with success in Africa as he was being accused of poisoning the Africans. Oh, yes. I mean, the uh, Borlaug was being accused of poisoning the African, and the Swaminathan was uh, working with Borlaug in India. Uh, Borlaug was more focused on wheat and maize, and Swaminathan was more focused on rice, you know, you the West and the East. And both were accused uh, because when you go from poverty to wealth or relative wealth, well, some people become better off than others. And, you know, at the very beginning, everything was poor. <laughs> so you had total equality in poverty. Then when you have progress and trade, some people become more wealthy because they are better entrepreneurs and they are more successful. And immediately, you know, you have some uh, yeah, left-wing ideologue who say it's awful, you know, we have inequality, worries, social justice, you know, in the, uh, and we are killing the earth by bringing chemicals. I mean, uh, this kind of um, anti-progress uh, attitude, as we mentioned before, is it's very difficult to discuss with these people because they are not really interested in facts. They are only interested in their own opinions and they want to look nice, they want to be with the angels, and reality is totally foreign to us. Um, sometimes it says that it's a religion. It's not a religion because the religion is ethical. This is an unethical religion which has no respect for the poor people in a way. Because the Green Revolution brought uh, a different life, a better life to the poorest people, not to the wealthy people. So if you want to be really ethical, you must be on the side of the facts and you be, must be on the side of the poorest people on earth. Absolutely. I sometimes say these views are based on political science, not biological science. Uh, yeah, well, we <laughs> even political science, you are too nice because when you say science, it's supposed that you take some facts into consideration. So it's not even political science. <laughs> I understand. I was fascinated by one of the quotes along this line that you had in your Wall Street Journal article called The Modern Food Miracle. You said it's easy to achieve equality when there is nothing to distribute. Leftists seem to prefer scarcity to plenty if plenty implies unequal portions. We see that playing out across the globe today. Absolutely. I mean, the, uh, but the, if I may quote a French political scientist, Tocqueville, writing about America, yeah. he said that the, uh, the Americans uh, will always be obsessed by equality and they would put equality above freedom if necessary. Yeah. So there is this tendency in the human being uh, based on envy, in a way, and that this trend, and we must fight against it to put equality first without looking at the human consequences. And as, as I said before, at the unethical human consequences of the search for equality at any price. One of the other quotes I saw in an article I thought was very pithy was, uh, science progresses, ideologies spin their wheels. <laughs> well, uh, it's pity, so I won't add anything. <laughs> <clears throat> but that's but in exactly. the, it's, it's, if, I, if I may, uh, it's interesting that ideology never changes in a way. I mean, they, it has, you know, different names. I mean, Sometimes it, it, it's called socialism or Marxism or, or whatever, or populism, I don't know. But basically, it's always the same. So ideology never changes. There's a big difference between ideology and science. Science do progress right. because it goes from one to B, okay, and from and from B to C based on facts. Ideology is not interested in facts, only in opinion and feelings, and so it cannot progress. One of the other parts in the, this article that I was fascinated by that I'd love for you to talk about, you mentioned the fact, and many people don't know this, that four-fifths of humanity, four-fifths of humanity is fed by calories originating in another country. So 
you, uh, you say that eating, quote, local and, quote, organic is a pleasant luxury reserved for privileged consumers. I, I see that in this country to a large degree. Well, to, to eat local is hard work. Yes. <laughs> uh, you need a lot of energy and a lot of money. You know, really? there was a, yeah, a good friend of mine, a journalist with the New Yorker, Adam Gopnik, just for play, decided to eat local in Manhattan for one week. So it was a full-time job to look for local food in Manhattan, even chicken. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was so funny. So to eat local has absolutely no meaning because even when you think you eat local, where does your local tomato comes, comes from? Right. Where does your soybean comes from? Nobody eats local. It right. has absolutely no meaning. I mean, the, uh, we eat global and we eat because through logistics and commerce, we are able to eat global, and this is the way we survive. Surely. Uh, interestingly, I, I think that uh, we, uh, we see that attitude. I, I guess what I would ask you, though, is uh, what do you see? Will, will this uh, tension always be with us, or, or what is the antidote? Uh, we have uh, put forth a, uh, a, a an agenda for USDA and farmers and producers called a, a, a technology agenda there to recognize the, the benefits of science and the progression to help us produce more with less environmental footprint so that we can keep our social obligation to uh, people for affordable food while we keep an economic sustainability for the people who produce it. Because mm -hmm. as you mentioned, eating local is hard work for any of us who've tried to have a garden you know how hard work that is, even just a local <laughs> garden. I have a garden. It's hard work. <laughs> and the outcome is so-so. And the, um, uh, you ask if there will always be a tension between these both trends. Yes, of course. There will always be a tension. And this tension between, I would say, anti-progress and ignorance and ideology on one side and facts and real progress on the other side, this requires us to be very strong, to be uh, very um, elaborate and able to defend our arguments. And also, I think that the, uh, there's a tendency uh, at, from, at the school level um, to uh, be less aware of what science is about, you know? Uh, when I was a young kid, I mean, the, we all believed in science and progress. But now in school, the education is putting on the same side, uh, at the same level, facts and opinions. So the struggle starts, you know, at a very young age. I think it's very important at a very young age, at primary school, college, and so on, I mean, to educate the people about what science means, how science works. If not, they will be totally confused and put once again on the same level their belief and facts. You know, you mentioned in this article as well, there are two things that I see that are under attack uh, in even our country, the United States today, but certainly globally. And uh, the foundation of what you said was uh, lifting people out of hunger. The two pillars were science and capitalism. Both of those are under attack. and. Uh, from a political perspective, as well as from a scientific perspective. So what is the antidote? You, you, I guess you mentioned early, early training of understanding the, the factual aspect of how we really benefit people's lives, but what other contribution do you have regarding uh, how we communicate this culturally? Um, I think a, um, the debate mostly is around capitalism, uh, which is not the right word. I think a, I'm pro-market. I'm not pro-capitalism. Capitalism yeah. is a word which was invented by Karl Marx in a way. Huh. So uh, we don't use the right vocabulary. We don't use the right words. We are pro-market. We are pro-entrepreneurship. We are pro-free market. Free market means freedom. So I think the way we speak is extremely important. Because if you say capitalism, you are already on the defensive. If you say I'm pro-market, I'm pro-free market, it means that you are on the side of freedom. So the way we talk, the vocabulary we use, I, uh, it's absolutely uh, decisive and starting at a very young age. 
and of course in the way you we express ourselves scholars scientists and politicians i i think that's a great point i've always felt even as a young adult that really trade and uh and, and market swapping between countries was really the ultimate uh, path to peace uh, global peace in that regard as we become interdependent upon one another well trade is peace in a way i mean the uh, this has been explained I mean, since the 18th century uh, by adam smith and others that uh, the best way you know to to keep peace in to build is to build trade when you trade you don't go at war so this is why trade is essential not only on the topic we are talking about you know regarding uh, food and all that but also it's really the way to be at peace together with no exception so i won't go into details but you know uh i think uh, dealing with china is very complicated with india is very complicated but it's through trade that we will reach some kind of a uh, reconciliation and balance playing on the interest on both sides well, hopefully we can continue in that regard uh in this effort uh, so we are uh, we're obviously at crossroads here as uh, we look to advance our uh, agenda in agricultural technology which is really uh, trying to do more with less less mm -hmm. environmental footprint less uh, you know you know there's no farmer that wants to poison the land uh, <laughs> so generations can't use it it's uh, not to their benefit uh, and so we we need to keep the environment in mind but as we said uh, for people in uh, less fortunate countries uh, we need to keep food uh, affordable in that regard because uh, for them to be able to consume it they have to be able to to purchase it and then uh, certainly our producers need to be uh, economically stable as well and have a livelihood for them and their families as well so uh, that's a that's quite a balance we have before us yeah but I, i'm quite optimistic uh because the um the fruit producers in the United States or in Europe know that they have to find this balance, you know, between environment and productivity. They are totally aware of that, okay? And also I'm very optimistic regarding science. It seems to me that the, uh, we are at the very beginning of the scientific revolution. You know, GMOs is very recent and the changes have been tremendous. The increase in productivity through GMOs is huge, as we all know, okay? With no bad consequences. Nobody ever became sick because of GMOs, and this is totally under control. But GMOs today, or this kind of technique, is being used only for a very limited number of crops, you know, basically maize and soybean. But what about wheat, potatoes? rice we don't yet use gmo so i think we are, we are the very very start very very beginning of a huge scientific revolution which will impact I mean, all the food chain so uh, there is no doubt about it and this is why we have i think we people believing in facts yeah. we have to be very strong in our defense of science and really explain to the people i mean all the benefits all the gains are seen 30 or 40 years. Well, that's exactly what we're trying to do. And that's one of the reasons I'm very concerned about the EU's proposal over their uh, form to fork, which is a sustainability, which we all agree with. But I think their technology of using anti-science or no science and going back, uh, backward in the future uh, uh, <laughs> is, is, the wrong, is the wrong approach. So I'm very concerned of their abilities and their efforts to export this kind of technology it looks like they're trying to bring the world down to their standards rather than coming up to the world standards of using modern technologies to produce food the being french and european i'm concerned as well yeah and i'm not the only one it's a it's a struggle within europe uh, on one side you have a very strong lobby of the uh, the green party yeah. playing politics and the other political parties you know trying to you know to use their influence uh, yeah to to keep their power so it's a political debate more than a scientific debate right. and the um 
also, uh, we are in a transition in Europe. I mean, the, we are becoming European, we are becoming global citizens, but we are in between, in between our past, which was very nationalistic, yeah. and our future, which will be totally global. So we are in between. It's a fight, and the, the, there is a way to win this fight, and that's the way I'm fighting in France. I try to explain the consumer the price they pay for this kind of policy. Because when you talk about protectionism, when you talk about organic food, and we talk about you know eating local and this kind of stuff, what the consumer do not understand that he or she pays for that, uh, the price of food, uh, you take milk, for example. Milk in France costs four times what it costs on the global market. This is a price that the consumers pay for this kind of stupid, you know, reactionary politics, but they don't know about it. They, yeah. But they will. So once again, it's a struggle, and it's a struggle which takes place not between the United States and Europe, but within the European Union. I mean, there are more and more rational people in Europe saying, look, uh, do the consumers really want to pay four times the price of the global market to buy his milk on a daily basis on his bread. So on the day when the consumers begin to understand that, this debate will be over. I, I think you're right. But I think, again, we've been victims of our own success and productivity because our consumers have had it fine so far. But as we continue to move toward protectionism and less scientific met methods that are uh, not as efficient, then I'm, I fear that uh, it will be hard to reverse that, and the consumers will uh, will face uh, higher prices uh, as a result of the policies that they thought they wanted. I, I likened it a few days ago, Guy, to uh, the sentimentality of the ocean liners. I said, I guess we could cancel all the transatlantic flights and go back to the ocean liners, which was very, uh, <laughs> uh, very uh, sentimental there, but it wouldn't be much commerce. Yeah, you know, uh you said something which is very important. I mean, progress is immediately taken for granted. Okay, you have a headache, you take an aspirin, you are cured. Yeah. It's evident. You forget that in the past there was no aspirin. Okay, right. you yeah. eat what you want on a daily basis. I mean, you eat strawberries in December, and yeah. it's evident. You totally forget that the strawberries are imported from Chile or another place. Not right. that that the beauty and the complexity of progress, progress is immediately taken for granted. And this is why, as we said before, and I think you, I mean, as an elected official and myself as a scholar, we are, we are there to fight. Uh, we are there to fight for, not for, pro just for facts, you know, information, facts, I mean, explaining, and it's endless. You and I will never win. We'll fight until the end of our life, you know. But this is our duty, and this is our job, and this is why you've been elected, and this is why I'm writing. <laughs> well, I've uh, just written down another Guy Simone quote uh, that uh, <laughs> progress will always be taken for granted immediately, and uh, I guess that's <laughs> a battle that we have. But thank you for being in the uh, in this fight for so long and continuing there to write and to expose many of the non-factual opinions that are, as you indicated earlier, I think absolutely unethical when it talks about feeding a hungry world and continuing as we see a population growth uh, approaching what, what demographics say or maybe 10 billion people by 2050. It's going to take science and technology and progress to do that. So thank you for staying by the stuff, very courageously uh, mentioning many of the things that you've written about. And it's been an absolute uh, thrilled to be able to get to speak with you personally and I appreciate you joining us today. Thank you Mr. Secretary. Next time we do lunch in the United States and not on a virtual Zoom conference. <laughs> <laughs> I would welcome that and I hope you'll take us up on that. You're always welcome here at USDA and I would love to just have a very much longer conversation with you because you're a, a wealth of history and knowledge in this effort that in this battle we continue on. So I want to thank everyone today for listening to the sunny side of the farm. It's been a fascinating
conversation with uh, Guy Simon, uh, a very accomplished uh, economist in France and uh, understands uh, exactly what we're facing globally about the challenges of feeding a growing mankind uh, across the world. So thank you, Guy, and thank you all for joining us, and we look forward to having you back with us on our next episode. Thanks for tuning into this episode of The Sunny Side of the Farm, and I look forward to visiting you again next month.